Hello everyone and welcome back. So last class we talked about the degree of maps between spheres. This time we're going to use that degree to define a homology theory on CW complexes. This is my favorite homology theory to work with. It's much simpler than all of the other ones and if your space is a CW complex this is usually the homology you want to work with. Uh, and it also tends to have different um, interpretations in other fields of math. For example, in the theory of smooth manifolds, it, it also pops up in a way called Morse homology, which you may encounter later in your life. Anyway, let's get to it. So last time we defined the degree of a map between n-dimensional spheres. And a map f from the n-sphere to the n-sphere has degree n if the induced map on the top level homology sends one to n. You should think of this as the end, one n-dimensional sphere, the domain n-dimensional sphere, wraps around the target n-dimensional sphere n times. And here's an interesting fact that we won't prove, but is good to keep in mind. Two maps from Sn to Sn are homotopic if and only if their degrees agree. One direction we're able to prove Right. If the degree, if the degrees don't agree, then the maps cannot be homotopic. So that's the uh, this implication. Uh, the other direction is a little more intense, but uh, it there are times today where I might say attach something by the degree n map. So you know what I mean. It's unique up to homotopy. Great. So uh, recall that a CW complex. is built by attaching uh, attaching n cells so dn to the n minus 1 skeleton which we denote xn minus 1 by maps Uh, I'll just call them f from now for now, from the boundary of dn, which is s n minus one, to that n minus one skeleton. So our goal for today is to define a homology theory. which is called cellular homology. I'll denote it as H star of CW. And it'll be based on these attaching maps. And uh, just, just for today, CW complexes will have finitely many cells in each dimension. This theory actually works totally fine, and you should think about how it works fine in, in the case of infinitely many cells, but I just want to sometimes enumerate things by numbers, and it's not going to be possible if I have infinitely many things. So CW complexes will have finitely many cells in each dimension just for convenience again. All right, so here's our first order of business. I want to sort of classify maps from an N cell, the boundary of an N cell, more precisely, to the N minus one skeleton. But the N minus one skeleton is not quite a sphere. I mean, it could be very complicated, but maybe if we restrict some information, quotient out some unnecessary information, we get a nicer space to work with. So here's an observation. If X is a CW complex, then if I take the N skeleton and I mod out by the N minus one skeleton, 
I get something homotopic to the wedge sum of k spheres. And this is exactly the number of n cells. So this isn't too hard to see abstractly. Uh, what you did was you, you had some n cells glued on to this other space, right? But then you crushed that whole space to a point. And so what were the possible attaching maps? You don't have really any possible attaching maps. You just have to send the whole boundary to a point. So you take all these spheres, you send the whole boundaries to the point, and so you get a wedge. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm going to draw a, a picture or two to convince you. So here is a one-dimensional CW complex. So this is the one skeleton. And now what happens if I look at the one skeleton modulo the zero skeleton? Well, that needs to uh, squish together all of uh, the, the zero cells. And so these points are going to come together sort of over here. And that's going to form this extra loop. So I get this wedge of three circles, which is a wedge of three one spheres. Uh, and here's another example. Here's the torus, T2, uh, which is equal to its two skeleton because it's a two-dimensional CW complex. And now if I just crush that whole boundary to a point, this is just a wedge of one sphere, which is x2 modulo x1. OK, so then attaching an n cell gives a map. Uh, I'm just going to call it f from Sn to the wedge of k n spheres. And this is obtained by composing the attaching map which uh, went from This, so an N cell is attached along Sn minus one. Uh, and this needs to go to the N minus one skeleton. So I compose this with the quotient map. Oh, and so of course these should be all right, <laughs> I'm sorry, I want to make these, let's make these n plus 1 cells so that all these can be n's. Okay, so I, I compose that with the quotient map uh, xn goes to xn modulo xn minus 1, which we've seen is a bunch of n spheres. All right, so... Now let's look at what happens on homology. So on homology, we get a map F star from Z to the nth homology. So this is the nth homology of Sn. And this is going to go to the entomology of the wedge of K S N's, which is the direct sum of K Z's, which we can call Z to the N. So this sends one to some list of integers. And the map is completely determined by where it sends one because the domain is a cyclic group. So this will send one to n1, n2, all the way up to nk. And this is what we're going to work with here. So this is, 
this is an important bit to make sure you understand. Okay. Now, you can think of this as like a sort of multi-degree. In fact, further quotienting out by all but, say, the ith sphere gives a map uh, of degree and i. So I have a sphere. I'm mapping it to a bunch of spheres. And maybe it gets sent to like, it wraps around the first one and one times, the second one and two times, and maybe there's a third one, goes over and three times. But I can quotient by say, all of that subspace, just collapse it to a point. And what I get is this composition is degree N2. So it's just counting sort of a bunch of degrees. All right, so we're actually ready to define our homology theory already. So let CN, CW, be the free abelian group generated by the N cells. And so just to make sure you don't get confused here, I'm going to blur the lines a little bit between the N cell itself and the element which lives in CNCW, so like the free abelian group generated by that element. But it should hopefully not cause too much confusion. Okay, so now if EIN is an N cell, Uh, it is attached by a map with multi-index ni1, ni2, all the way up to nik. And so this is basically the free abelian group, like this coordinate contains the free abelian group generated by E1 n minus one. This is E2 n minus one. So this is a list of multiples of lower dimensional simplices in some sense. All right. So we define the boundary n map from CN CW to CN minus one CW on each cell by the boundary of E I N. So this needs to be a sum of lower dimensional cells with multiples, right? And you do basically the only sensible thing you can. I'll take the sum as J goes from one to K of N E ah. N I J E <laughs> J N minus one. Sorry about that. Just getting lost in uh in the indices, but like logically it's it's the easiest thing you can do. You take a you take an N cell. It wraps five times around this cell, 
three times around the other cell. And so the boundary map takes you to five times the cell it wrapped around five times, plus three times the cell it wrapped around three times. And uh, I suppose this case isn't completely determined. Uh, boundary zero is the zero map and boundary one is just initial minus terminal. So what do I mean by that? Uh, boundary one needs to take in, uh, sorry, sorry, terminal minus initial. Terminal vertex minus initial vertex. So boundary one takes in a one cell and it's supposed to give me a sum of zero cells and on generators, it's the usual thing. The last vertex minus the first vertex. Okay, and here's a fact that we won't prove. We're not gonna prove a lot of things today because this is more something I want you to get your hands dirty with. So, boundary star, I mean, boundary squared is zero. So we get a homology theory, which I'll call H star of CW. And moreover, if X is a CW complex, then all of these are equal. The CW homology of X, the simplicial homology of X, and the singular homology of X. So simplicial homology and singular homology are always isomorphic for spaces that are simplicial complexes. If the space happens to have an even finer structure of being a CW complex, then it is also, uh, it also has the CW homology, which is equal to all of those other homology theories. Great. So let's do some examples. And let's start with maybe our favorite examples. Uh, Let's do the CW homology of the orientable surface of genus G. And you'll see how powerful and nice this theory is. So recall that the CW decomposition of sigma G looks like, okay, so it's this 2n gone. A1, B1, and then sort of A1 inverse, B1 inverse, all the way around. And at the very end, I'll have AG, BG, AG inverse, and BG going the other way. So this is a cell decomposition of the genus G surface with a single two cell over here and two G one cells. Uh, so there's a single zero cell. So C naught CW of sigma G is Z. C one CW of sigma G like we said, is z to the 2g, a1, b1, a2, b2, all of those. And then c2 of cw is z, and that came from that single two cell. So already our chain groups are looking real nice and small. What does the chain complex look like? Well, every one cell has both ends 
attached to the same zero cell. So initial terminal minus initial uh, is telling me that boundary one is exactly the zero map. The two cell is attached along, okay, A1, B1, A1 inverse, B1 inverse, A2, B2, A2 inverse, B2 inverse, all the way up to AG, BG, AG inverse, BG inverse. Now, how do I think about this multi-degree? Well, if I quotient out by all of the other cells except for a1 essentially i make all of the other uh all the other group elements one and so all that's left over is maybe the a1 and so when looking at how many times i wind around a1 i wind around once going one way once going the other way total times zero so each uh Each uh, degree is zero since they all cancel. All right, and so boundary two is also the zero map. Okay, so what's our chain complex? Couldn't be easier. Z, Z to the two G, Z, zero, this is a zero map, this is a zero map. Okay, so H, uh, N of sigma G is equal to, in the zeroth degree, it's Z in the first degree, so this is if N is equal to zero, Z to the two G, if n is equal to one, because everything's in the kernel and nothing's in the image. Uh, and again, everything's in the kernel, nothing's in the image, and it's zero otherwise. That's a lot faster than using the Meyer via Torres sequence. It's faster than using simplicial homology. It's possible, while it's imp impossible to do by hand using singular homology, so I hope we really appreciate how nice to work with this theory is after this example. So here's something you can do right now to uh, test your understanding if you want to pause. You can try to work out RP2. And if you're feeling more ambitious, you can work out general non-orientable surfaces. All right, let's take this up one more dimension. Let's do some three-dimensional CW complex. Let's do the homology of the three torus. This involves a little bit of geometric hand-waving, but I hope it'll be instructive. So T3 has the following CW decomposition. Okay, so there's this cube. So wh what is T3? It's, uh, it's a cube where, first of all, I have tori here. Uh, and sort of tori on the side as well. And also in the back here, uh, okay, this will be a B. Okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna label the back, but I'll tell you the back is glued to the front by the identity map. So that top bar is A going this way. The uh, bottom bar is also A, the right bar is B, the left bar is B. So I take a torus 
and I cross it with the interval, but then I glue the front to the back. I take a two torus, cross it with the interval, glue the front to the back. That's like crossing the torus with S1, and so that's the three torus, right? Okay, now let's look at the cellular homology of this decomposition. Uh, so, like before, there's actually only one zero cell. And so, the boundary one map has no, no chance of being non-trivial. It's, it's just zero because every line is going to start and end at the same vertex. Great. And also, there are three two cells. Uh, there's the front face, which is the same as the back face. There's the right face, which is the same as the left face. And there's the top face, which is the same as the bottom face. So, uh, those are the three two cells. And how are they attached? Well, let's just maybe look at one. This two cell is attached along A, let's start at the bottom, A, B, A inverse, B inverse. In other words, it has multi-degree zero, zero. So they're all attached like two tori, so the boundary two map is also zero. Okay, let's do, now the three cell takes a little bit of, uh, of thinking. So what about the three cell? Uh, so let's maybe just look at one instance of this. Let's look at degree in the two cell, which I'll label A, which is the front face, which is also the back face. So first of all, where is the three cell? It's a the three cells a three ball attached along S2. And it's the middle of that cube. That cube is filled in. And uh, I'll draw it in sort of here. This is it shrunken down. If you imagine that, that tiny blue ball I drew blowing up, that's the three cell. And now let's track how it's attached. Uh, okay, so let me <laughs> draw this again bigger. Okay, so it's, here it comes. It wraps around A once, and then it, it sort of wraps around this other face. I don't care about that. Let me draw that in a different color. And then it wraps around A again, and then it wraps around sort of down here. And all this time it is, it's filling up the, uh, the left and the right, but uh, I don't care about that right now. I just care about what's happening in the A direction. So this blue part of the attaching map here, blue part of the map, differs from the purple part of the map by a reflection across this yellow plane that I drew in here. Uh, and so whatever the degree of the blue part is, it needs to be negative the degree of 
the yellow part, right? We've learned that if you compose a map with a reflection, the degree changes by negative one. And so the total degree in the A portion is zero. So uh, there's a couple ways to see this if you didn't like that argument. I mean, you're attaching this three bowl and you trace out A basically from bottom to top going one way and then from top to bottom the other way. So you, you did a map and then you undid the map. If you do a map and undo the map, it's the same thing as doing nothing. And so that's another reason intuitively why this should be a degree zero map. Now also uh, this picture is symmetric. I can easily rotate the cube and make the same argument for the left and right edges. So uh, the boundary three map is just equal to zero. It's zero in the front to back face, it's zero in the left to right face, and this is zero in the top to the bottom face, so it's just t totally zero. So let's write down the uh, chain groups here. So chain groups of T3, this is zero in degree four. I have a single three cell. Uh, there are three two cells. Remember that's that front to back, top, bottom, left, right. There's three one cells, which are, uh, here, I'll, I'll draw them in. Uh, dark green right here on the picture. That's one of them. That's another, and that's another, and all the other ones are, are gluings of those three. And there's a single zero cell, and that's the negative one dimension. Okay, so uh, all of these we learned were actually the zero map. And so when you have a chain complex where all of the maps are the zero maps, the homology groups are the chain groups. So HN of the three torus is equal to Z if N is equal to three or zero, Z cubed if N is equal to one or two, and zero otherwise. So even in higher dimensional examples, CW homology can be fairly straightforward to calculate. There was a little bit of geome geometric finagling there, but um, much easier than something you would have done by chopping this up into a singular, uh, sorry, a simplicial complex. Okay, so I think we're starting to see some patterns emerge here. Let's note those down. So here are some general properties. This will be just a, a list of, basically the first three are just generalizations of each other. The most specific statement is if X is N dimensional, then HI of X for I greater than N is equal to zero. Uh, so if i is bigger than n, there's no i cells in this decomposition, so ci is going to be zero. And if your chain group is zero, your homology group needs to be zero, right? Uh, so this is all if x is a CW complex. Also, if X has no I cells, then HI of X is equal to zero. Again, the ith chain group is going to be zero, which means the ith homology group needs to be zero, of course. Also, here's a slightly more general statement. If X has K I cells, then 
H I of X is generated by at most K elements. That, that is, it's like a rank at most K group. And again, that's because the nth chain group is generated by K elements. And if you uh, look at the kernel, that's the subgroup of a free abelian group generated by less things. And then you take a quotient of that. You, all you do is cut down things when you go to homology. Also, if X has no twos of its cells in adjacent dimensions, then HI of X is free abelian and generated by its cells. And this is for all I. So, I mean, the, the argument here is just that uh, the chain complex is Cn of x to 0 to Cn minus 2 of x to 0 to Cn minus 4 of x to 0, and so on and so forth. I mean, if you just look at the Cn minus 2 level, uh, the kernel of the map needs to be everything because it's mapping into the zero group and the image of the group coming in is zero. And so the homology group is CN minus two and CN minus two is generated by cells. So the homology group is generated by cells. This seems like a kind of specific situation, uh, but it has one at least important example. So recall that CPN, the complex projective space, was built out of one even dimensional cell in each dimension, each even dimension up to 2N. So, okay, then the chain group of CPN with this cellular decomposition is a Z in dimension 2N, a Z in dimension 2N minus 2, all the way up in, until a Z in dimension 2, and a Z in dimension 0. And so the homology groups of CPN are very easy to calculate. Uh, so H I of CPN is equal to Z if I is even and I is less than or equal to 2N and otherwise it's zero. So uh, I should mention that there is an infinite construction called CP infinity, where you continue attaching even dimensional cells high, higher and higher up by some prescribed rules. Uh, and you can calculate the homology there. Uh, so note, there is a space called CP infinity with homology Z in every even dimension. So you can even build objects like this and analyze them very easily using CW homology. And this space seems a little arbitrary, but it is actually very important. It's what's called an eilenberg maclean space, and uh, it, it plays an important role in homotopy theory. So I should say now is a good time to check out uh, RPN 
I'm not going to do this example here, but Hatcher's textbook has a good example of calculating the homology groups of RPN, which is very similar to this. All right, so the last thing I want to do for today is to show you how to build spaces with a given homology. So making spaces with given homology. So recall that the map Fn from S1 to S1 given by f of z is equal to z to the n is a degree n map. And as it stands, I think all we've seen are degree minus one maps on spheres. So here's a question, how do I get a degree n map on a sphere? Well, the answer is suspension. So also recall that the suspension of Sn is Sn plus 1. So remember suspension, I take my space, I cross it with i, and then I crush the top and the bottom. You can see for at least S1 that it's, it's very clear that the suspension of S1 is S2, and it actually works for higher dimensions too. And if you write things down in coordinates, it's, it's not too bad to see. Uh, so, and moreover, a map F from x to y induces a map the suspension of f from the suspension of x to the suspension of y. And how does this go? Well, if I have a map from x to y, I can get a map from x cross i to y cross i, just at each level I do the map f. And now, for a suspension, I also crush the tops. Where do I send that point at the very top of x, of the suspension of x? Well, I send it to the point at the top of suspension of y. Great. Uh, so, let's see if we can get all this to play nicely. So, in the meyer viatoris sequence, for the suspension of s n minus 1, we got uh, this little bit here, hn of sn, so this is the suspension of sn minus 1, down to hn minus 1 of sn minus 1 to 0, and this was that boundary star map. Now, uh, note that suspension of Fn, so this is a map from S2 to S2, respects the uh, north-south hemisphere decomposition. So by the naturality of boundary star, we got a commutative diagram. So I didn't spell out all the details here, but the, the idea is if you have a map which respects your decomposition in the meyer viatoris sequence, then it plays nicely with the boundary star map in the meyer viatoris sequence. And what does it mean to play nicely? It means to get a commutative diagram. And this commutative diagram looks like hn of sn maps over by boundary star to hn minus 1 of sn minus 1. And here I'll have fn, and here I'll have the suspension of fn. All right, now if I go down like this, I suppose 
So this should be ones and twos, not quite ends yet. So Fn is a map from S1 to S1. I'll get a map Fn star. I am fixing all of this diagram up. All right, so this should be right now. Okay, now when I go on the right, Fn is a degree n map. So this is a degree n map. So when I map over on the top side, I get a degree n map. And that boundary star is an isomorphism. So it sends one to plus or minus one. But that means that this side needs to be multiplication by n. And therefore, so by commutativity, uh, commutativity, we have that the suspension of F star is a degree n map. So something nice we could do is iterate this construction. So iterating this construction, shows that if I take this Fn map and I suspend it, uh, say k minus one times, so that's now a map from sk to sk, this is a degree n map. So there are degree n maps for every n. And they're gotten by obtaining, uh, by suspending this uh, complex power map. All right. <laughs> so um, now let's construct some spaces with given homology groups. So from this, we can construct a space with hn of x equal to z mod m and hi of x equal to zero for i not equal to zero or n. And how do we do this? By attaching an N, N plus one cell to Sn. So this is thought of as a zero cell and an N cell. Uh, so I attach an N plus one cell to this by a map of degree N. So what do I get? The chain complex looks like this is in dimension n plus 1. This is in dimension n, that n cells coming from that Sn. This is going to be the zero map. And this is going to be multiplication by m. And so when you look at the homology here, uh, you get the desired results. That is entomology Z mod M. Everything else is zero except for at the zeroth level we get Z. Now let's generalize this. So let's set down the definition of what we want. So let G be an abelian group. First, not necessarily finitely generated or anything. And N greater than or equal to one, be an integer. A more space, M G N, 
is a CW complex with HN of MGN equal to G H0 of MGN is equal to Z and HI of MGN is equal to zero if I is not equal to zero or N. So it's, it's this group that picks out the group G in the nth homology and has nothing else going on in homology otherwise. Uh, just one more caveat. If N is greater than one, we also require that pi one of MGN is equal to zero. And the reason we, we insist on this is just to make this space unique up to homotopy equivalence among CW complexes. All right, so let me show you how to build a more space for a finitely generated abelian group. The uh, Hatcher's book also has a way to do this for arbitrary finite abelian groups, and it's, it's not much more complicated, but this, I think, is a nice geometric construction. So for a finitely generated abelian group G, uh, so by the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups, uh, G is isomorphic to Z to the K, direct sum Z to the Z mod D1, direct sum all the way up to Z mod DL. All right, so here's what how I construct this. So to construct M, G, N, so this is with this finally generated abelian group G, Take the wedge of L plus K N cells for the N skeleton and attach uh, L N plus one cells by maps of degree D1 up to DL to separate N spheres. So what do I mean? I mean, uh, so I have this wedge of spheres, take my first N plus one cell, and if I see the group Z mod D1, I'll attach that N plus one cell to maybe the first n sphere by a map of degree d1, take the next n plus one cell and attach it by a map of degree d2 to the next sphere and continue gluing along spheres like this. And you can see that you just write down the chain groups, which are easy to see, uh, that you get exactly this group here. So let's take this one step further so recall that the pth homology group of a wedge sum of CW complexes is equal to the direct sum of the homology groups of the XIs. Uh, so, so given this, if I have a list of groups G1 up to GL, we can construct a space X with HI of X being this group GI by wedging together 
the more spaces M G I uh, at level I. So that's about as good of a theorem as you can hope for. Give me any list of abelian groups. I can give you back a space whose homology group at that level that you want is the group that you want. So I hope you can see that uh, the CW homology is a very powerful theory, especially for constructing examples and also for taking nice examples and getting quick computations out of them. So next time we'll explore another facet of homology called the Euler characteristic, which is one of the most ubiquitous quantities in all of mathematics. I'm looking forward to it and I'll see you next time.